no stranger to foreign affairs from his perch in Ottawa, Member of Parliament Garnet Genuis. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you, and uh, it's, it's gratifying to see uh, so many people that are interested in these important issues out on a Saturday morning. Uh, I'm going to share some reflections on the information war, the battle for ideas and opinions, especially here in the West, about Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Now, this is the first European war of the social media age. There have been and, and there are other wars in the social media age, but they have been in instances where Western powers have taken a less active role, and they have also generally been where the peoples involved are less connected to communications technology. Because this is the first major war for us of the social media age, we're much more connected to it. We can follow Twitter accounts that offer on-the-ground perspectives. I receive text and WhatsApp messages from people close to the front line. My assistant in my office in Ottawa is from Zaporizhia, and she shares photos and videos with me from her travels and from her family members. Now, I think that this war, being in the social media age, means two particular things for us. Uh, one positive and one negative from the perspective of trying to build solidarity for the Ukrainian cause. The positive is that the ability to communicate and see images from the ground can enhance our emotional connection with and our empathy for people who are suffering. It is possible and it is good to have a rational solidarity, but generally our commitment to solidarity and our sustained engagement and support of victims of violence is helped along by images driving feelings which remind us of the humanity of those who suffer. I felt this deeply myself. The feeling of closeness to a conflict helps to fortify and sustain my own personal commitment to the Ukrainian cause beyond what would result from reason alone. So it is important to share stories and images from the ground along uh, with the necessary descriptions of the kinds of crimes being committed. And this is more possible than ever because of the communications technology we now all use. On the negative side, the challenge from a communications perspective is that in a war in the age of social media, bad actors have a much easier time being part of the conversation. The Russian regime, as well as other bad actors, are getting themselves into the conversation here in Canada and throughout the West. People in our country, people in my own constituency, are hearing what bad geopolitical actors have to say and are taking that into consideration as they shape their own views of the war. And this was always the case a little bit. There were communists in the West during the Cold War, fascists during World War II, and probably a few admirers of Napoleon in the Anglosphere in the 19th century. But in the absence of very efficient and ubiquitous communications technology, these fifth columnists or useful idiots uh, had, to connect with, had, had to contend with the inevitable reality that the vast majority of communications that people were hearing were from within their own societies. Communications were generally local by necessity. But now the conversation about the invasion of Ukraine is a global conversation. Through proxies, but also not through proxies, Vladimir Putin is talking to my constituents. Through misdirection and disinformation, but he is making his case. Political conversations that were once local and national, uh, again perhaps with foreign aligned participants, but still local and national, are now global conversations. It's fair and understandable to be annoyed and upset about this development. It can be frustrating. Um, but being annoyed and upset about this will not change the reality. Our society can try to filter out external voices through a censorious approach to misinformation and disinformation from abroad. We can try. And I do support the removal of the most blunt and direct forms of this broadcasting by foreign hostile regimes, such as the removal of RT from Canadian airwaves. Maybe this makes a difference at the margins because it means that someone who is casually channel surfing won't stumble upon Putin's propaganda. But these kinds of blunt measures targeting traditional broadcasting don't change the fundamental realities of how this information is generally transmitted through the internet. A highly censorious approach to information on the internet would have very little chance of effectively filtering out the voices of foreign autocratic regimes. And meanwhile, it would still inevitably lead to significant limitations on domestic free speech and free exchange of ideas. Fundamentally, changing our society in ways that limit the free flow of information and open debate seems like a very high price to pay for a still unlikely to be successful attempt to filter out foreign hostile voices. Um, thankfully, there are alternatives. While the Canadian discourse on combating misinformation and disinformation or foreign propaganda has generally emphasized state intervention, intensifying moderation and outright censorship, 
the Taiwanese are implementing a series of much more powerful tools to respond to propaganda from hostile foreign actors. Rather than censorship, the Taiwanese model emphasizes increasing awareness among and empowerment of its citizens. Citizen education about how to spot foreign misinformation and civil, and civil society driven efforts to inform the public about specific instances of misinformation are very effective. While the disinformation still gets in, this education helps make the population more immune to its impacts. Think of misinformation as a kind of virus. If there's a new virus in the world, maybe you try to keep that virus out of your country. But your chances of doing that for any length of time are very low. Eventually, it will get through. The only way to really protect your population in the medium to long term is through immunity, including through tools such as vaccination. Having a population that is immune to the virus is a much more secure path than trying to keep the virus out. Maybe you do some of both, but immunity is what is really keeping you safe. Information travels much faster than a virus can. So one key recommendation that I have in general is that we lean heavily on awareness and immunization against foreign misinformation, uh, not particularly or at least not solely on inevitably incomplete efforts to keep bad ideas out. In this globally connected world, we need to educate ourselves and our citizens about how to spot foreign misinformation. I also think governments need to be more open and transparent about these threats. The voluntary sharing of information about specific foreign interference threats can play a powerful role in disarming these threats. And yet the Canadian government today seems bent on secrecy even in cases where transparency would be better for national security. I think of the recent case of the Winnipeg Lab documents, for instance, where information was long hidden about how scientists at the Winnipeg Lab transferred information to the government of China. There was no reason why the public shouldn't have been told this much earlier, except that it was embarrassing to the sitting government. If this information were out earlier, then remedial action might have been taken by other institutions much faster. So through education and transparency, we can build a society that is more resilient and discerning in response to foreign disinformation. Now, I think one of the particular problems that I have seen in the information war today is, is that the further invasion of Ukraine by Russia began at a time of high polarization and mistrust in public institutions in North America. We could obviously spend a whole day talking about that one piece. But I, I think the key point is that many institutions did fail badly during COVID. They weren't ready for the kind of disaster scenario that they actually should have been prepared for. They gave rapidly changing and contradictory advice without projecting the kind of humility that should accompany uncertainty. Rules were, in many cases, arbitrary and arbitrarily enforced, leading to very different impacts on different groups of people. And many people who were hurt by COVID and COVID policies were intentionally demonized by political leaders seeking heightened polarization in order to advance their own agendas. The impact of all of this was that there are a lot of people out there who do not trust the government or media and feel motivated to run in the opposite direction of any emerging consensus. I empathize with people who feel this way. Institutions cannot simply demand trust irrespective of their performance. Institutions must earn trust. After COVID, there are institutions who need to earn trust back, including by more forthrightly acknowledging their mistakes. I would also say that no person or institution is always right or always wrong. Even a broken clock is right twice a day and even the best clocks on the planet still have to be adjusted every now and again. If you always follow the prevailing consensus, then you're a sheep. Uh, but if you always do the opposite of the prevailing consensus, you're also a sheep, just a, a flipped around sheep. So I, I wanna encourage citizens, and I, I always encourage people when I'm, I'm talking about, about responding to information from different sources, is that you need to be discerning and to critically evaluate the arguments that you hear from any source. This illusionment with Western institutions uh, that get it wrong some of the time should obviously not lead us to accept as the alternative informations which are obviously manufactured propaganda. The choice is not between believing everything CBC says and believing everything RT says. One is certainly worse than the other, but you should apply a skeptical eye to both and cross-reference the information you receive from both uh, more credible and less credible sources. But certainly prevailing mistrust does make our, our efforts in this area harder. On many of these points, I, I think I'm probably preaching to the converted here, uh, but I do want to really challenge you to take the time to reason with people you meet about these issues. I've had the experience, and I'm sure most people here have as well, where you're at a party or a family reunion or even at the office, and someone says something to you about, about Russia and Ukraine that clearly reflects Russian state narratives and disinformation. If you're like me, then in those moments, 
Your mind goes back to those images of violence that you've, that you've seen on social media, the realities of the conflict, and, and your initial response is just to get angry and frustrated, maybe want to want to roll your eyes and, and walk away. But the information war does depend on all of us being willing to step up on all of us being willing to take the time to have those conversations with people who are asking questions. I'm convinced that many of the people inclined to buy into Russian state narratives are doing so because they've had only superficial exposure to the topic. Bad arguments get repeated over and over again in niche circles if no one is there willing to step up and challenge them. So in those moments where you hear things, my, my challenge to you is to slow down, to really listen, to take the other person seriously and to respond substantially to what they're saying so as to dissuade them from their errant line of thinking. Now as part of this talk, I think it is useful to look at and think about the kinds of arguments that the Russian state is making to try to persuade people who live here and what we can say in response. Uh, so as we've heard already, some of the line that you might hear is the it's NATO's fault argument. This was prominent in Tucker Carlson's interview, the idea that NATO expansion forced Putin's hand. NATO is, though, we should remind folks, a defensive military alliance. <coughs> Membership obliges countries to come to each other's aid if they are attacked. It does not oblige cooperation in offensive wars. NATO had, had no role, for instance, in the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003 uh, or in current uh, uh, Turkish government adventurism in various places. Russia's leaders purport to be concerned about NATO expansion, the process of more nations voluntarily applying for membership in this defensive alliance. But Russia's leaders cannot pretend to be ignorant about why countries on their border want to be members of this defensive alliance. Russia has a long-standing habit of invading its non-NATO neighbors. Russian soldiers are in the sovereign territory of Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. Russian soldiers are not, however, in the former Soviet republics of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Because these Baltic countries are covered by the defensive security umbrella of NATO, NATO enlargement has been driven by the voluntary and highly rational wish of nations to secure themselves from an expansionist Russia. Uh, Russia's leaders complaining about NATO enlargement sounds a bit like a would-be burglar complaining about my new alarm system. The fact that they feel threatened by the enlargement of a defensive alliance is itself revealing of malicious intentions. Now another, uh, I think, very bad argument is the historical and linguistic ties argument. Now Russia's leaders like to highlight that parts of Ukraine were historically part of Russia and contain many Russian speakers. Their arguments tend to rely at points on false history. However, it is true that Russia has occupied parts of Ukraine off and on for a long time. And it is also true that many Ukrainians speak Russian. And it is similarly true that Britain ruled India for a long time and that there are French-speaking people in Belgium. Historical ties or language are not the basis of nationhood and they do not justify invasion. A nation is a voluntary political community which can and often does transcend ethnic and linguistic lines constituted to achieve particular ends. Every nation has an implicit or explicit purpose. It exists both as something and for something. And it's up to the people of an area to choose their national associations and their national objectives. The question in the Ukraine war is not fundamentally about where the border should be, but about who should get to decide where the border should be. I believe that the people of Ukraine should decide their own future, and they should have the freedom to choose their future with the ballot not the bullet. They must now use the bullet to defend the ballot because of arbitrary chosen Russian aggression. Now incidentally, I find it particularly surprising to hear confusion on this point from some American commentators. When such commentators suggest that Russia has a legitimate claim to parts of Ukraine because of the common history and language, someone should remind them of their own history. The United States came into being because a group of English-speaking Britons decided that they wanted to form their own political community in line with a different self-defined set of political values. If some English-speaking Britons could choose their own path apart from the much-exaggerated tyranny of George III, then surely Ukrainians have a right to choose their own future apart from Putin's obvious tyranny, regardless of the language that they speak. Now, even more outrageous to me, the critics of support for Ukraine are trying now to push the breathtakingly absurd idea that somehow support for Ukraine by the West is leading to the West being overextended. How long can we afford this, they ask, when we have challenges at home? In response to this, we should underline that we are in a situation where Ukrainians are doing all of the fighting in a war that could debilitate one of our greatest adversaries' capacity to wage aggressive war again for a long time. All they need from us is a little financial and military support the support required to keep Russia at bay and from our perspective to keep Russia far away. 
In the Afghan war against the Soviets, when one Stinger missile could bring down a Soviet helicopter gunship, no one doubted that the mi missile was worth the investment. The moral calculus and our obligation to solidarity with Ukraine is what matters to me most, but on strategic grounds as well, this is a real no-brainer. Relatively small investments by the West are defining a firm line to block the expansion of authoritarianism and I think could, if successful, send the message necessary to deter future conflicts and create a more safer, stable world. There has also been a persistent effort among critics of support for Ukraine to malign Zelensky himself, as if the entire Ukrainian cause is wrapped up in your perception of him as a person. I have frankly found Zelensky to be nothing but impressive, but that is really beside the point. The point is that one nation invaded another and is committing well-documented war crimes, including child abduction, torture, and sexual assault, in the process of trying to annex territory by force. Whether you like the democratically elected president of the invaded country is entirely beside the point. I hope that if Canada were invaded by Russia, people and nations who don't think much of Trudeau would still support our defense, because Canada is much more than Trudeau, just as Ukraine is much more than Zelensky. Now, the final thought that I wanted uh, to share is that Russia's leaders aren't just making arguments to try to muddy the waters on the invasion of Ukraine. They appear to be making arguments for their political model more generally. And I think we need to carefully notice what those arguments are and why some people have been fooled into finding them persuasive. Now, if I were to describe the story that I think they are trying to tell, the icon of today's Russian regime, the person who tells the story that they want to tell, is someone named Maria Lvova Belova. Out of curiosity, who's familiar with her? Okay, a couple, but not very many. Okay. So, so Lvova Belova presents an image of the nation that Putin wants people to see. She exposes both its predominant preferred narrative and how radically different it is from us, at least um, for most of us. So 39-year-old and, and female, Lvova Belova is uh, an outlier among Russia's leaders. She is the children's rights commissioner for the president of Russia. She's married to a Russian Orthodox uh, priest and they have, wait for it, 23 children. Most are adopted, sometimes in complicated circumstances as I'll describe. But on the face of it, she projects this image of traditional femininity that the re regime finds useful. A pious and family-oriented woman, deeply involved in charity work. Uh, above all, she's a person who is loyal to the state and to its client institutions. Russia's leaders are trying to tell a story about their alleged social conservatism, how in the face of the decadent West, they are the ones who believe in marriage and family and children. They are the ones who can yet tell the difference between a man and a woman. But underneath this image of a loving religious woman adopting children and standing up for children's rights, Lvova Belova is one of two people in Russia for whom the International Criminal Court has issued an arrest warrant. The other is Putin himself. As Canada's parliament recently heard, the Russian state is coordinating a campaign of systematic child abduction from Russian-occupied territories in Ukraine, stealing tens of thousands of children from Ukrainian families. Lvova Belova's title of Children's Rights Commissioner is particularly Orwellian, since she and her office are overseeing this horrific operation. She has even personally adopted one of these stolen children and has made this very child an instrument of Russian state propaganda. Removing children from a group for the purposes of eradicating that group is clearly defined in international law as genocide. Those of us reared on old Disney movies may have internalized the expectation uh, that a villain or a monster is quickly identifiable, that they look differently, they, they, have, they have horns on their head or something. Uh, but this is not the case in, in the real world, where villains can also be charming and genteel, uh, bouncing babies on their knee even while they're stealing other people's babies at the same time. In the real world, this ostensibly pious, caring, and charitable mother is also an indicted war criminal and the mastermind of a system of child stealing. She purports to be rescuing children from a dangerous military zone, even while vocally supporting the so-called military operation that makes their home into a dangerous war zone in the first place. But how can someone who professes to care about family and children be primarily responsible for destroying their homes, ripping them away from their existing loving families, even killing their parents and putting them into foreign state-run propaganda programs? How can we understand this apparent inconsistency? The dissonance between Lvova Belova's public presentation and her actions in government is typical of fascist regimes. The nature of fascism, generally, is that it uses the iconography of traditional conservatism, especially family and faith, to mask the ideology of totalitarian collectivism 
uh, quite akin to communism. This status ideology is fundamentally different from authentic conservatism, which rejects totalitarian coll collectivism and values the trio of family, faith, and freedom. For conservatives, family and faith find their greatest meaning in the presence of freedom because family and religion can best flourish in spaces apart from the state and when protected from state interference. By contrast, fascists reject institutional separation and want to reduce family and religion to merely fingers of state power. The subjugation of the family and of faith to state ends provides the justification for the kind of family-destroying violence for which Lvova Belova is responsible. Lvova's agenda pretends to be pro-family, but it only exists as such insofar as the family can be used to serve the Putin regime's end. Otherwise, family and faith are consistently attacked. So she is precisely the icon of Russia in the midst of this new information war. A pious and familial image presented uh, domestically and to the West, yet covering the most horrific and monstrous crimes. As the Russian state makes its arguments, we must persist in making ours. We must encourage our fellow citizens to see the Russian re regime for what it is and what it is doing. Its invasion of Ukraine is an expression of the view that might in the service of the state is always right. Its efforts to consolidate and totalize its power in Russia demonstrate the conviction that family and faith must always serve the state. Genocidal child killing is one crime among many through, through pardon me, genocidal child stealing uh, is one crime among many through which perceived state interests are put ahead of everything else. This statist authoritarianism is a radically different way of seeing the world uh, and it uh, presented a pressing threat to global security well before the beginning of 2022. Now I sympathize uh, with those who articulate a desire for peace. Uh, but when I hear calls for peace, I think of the nature of the Russian regime, and I am reminded of the immortal words of Admiral Nelson in the midst of the French Revolution, who said, although we might one day hope for peace with France, we must ever be at war with French principles. The only durable peace will be through Russian state reform, when Russia starts moving towards freedom and democracy, and when the heroes of Russia's democracy reform movements are able to finally have their day. Now on our side, we must remember that our principles are democratic ones. That is, they do rely on the common sense of the common people. That a virtuous and free people can see through the lies and discern the truth without mindlessly deferring to the judgment of domestic censors or bureaucrats. If we believe that democracy is the best system, then we should use the tools that democracy gives us to immunize our communities against disinformation through education and through having the steadfast patience to engage in substantive argument in defense of Ukraine and in defense of democratic principles. Thank you again for this opportunity. Have a great day.